the title and the schedule says uh, just introduction to thin film, which I will do too. But uh, I'm, I'm also supposed to talk about this high throughput combinatorial uh, methodology using thin film <coughs> for exploration of novel uh, quantum material. <coughs> so the way I, I set up this uh, uh, talk is uh, I, I will be spending, I add a few more slides to last, last year. So it's going to be probably one third, two third kind of breakdown. And uh, I ended my talk with this new results that we got on uh, uh, interesting uh, quantum uh, materials bilayer system that we made. Uh, which was optimized using the high throughput approach. Without this high throughput combinatorial approach, uh, we couldn't have done this. And also, it's it's a <clears throat> type of device experiment that could only be done with thin film. So that's uh, another um, um, advantage of uh, thin film that I'm going to be talking about. Okay, so um, so making especially high quality film is really important uh, these days. You can make you know we we call a lot of these films single crystal like films because they all <clears throat> Epitaxial and everything is lined up, but uh, you could actually make a truly like last week We had a visitor who talked about making single crystal film as in zero grain film. So such things are possible and uh, Are there materials that you can only make in thin film you can freeze in using epitaxy some special metastable phases that cannot be made otherwise and then also there are lots of properties that could only be observable in thin films like like a perfect uh, two-dimensional interface. You can't really, it's difficult to do that with uh, bulk uh, materials. <clears throat> so broadly speaking, there are three major types of a uh, deposition technique. And today, I'll be focusing on the physical vapor deposition techniques. And of course, you'll be hearing throughout the, um, the week uh, the details of some of these techniques as well. But <clears throat> so the CVD techniques, uh, I, I would say, most commonly used in the electronic industry because it's good for uh, making uh, uh, films with uh, high conformality and you can get large area uh, deposition. But I, I would say, I, I would you know, venture to make a um, sweeping statement that as long as you're working with a complex multi-component system, CVD techniques is not very useful. Like I remember in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, people were trying to make uh, YBC or the cuprate superconductors, they said, oh, this is going to change the world. We need to be able to make this large area. I think after 10 years, people gave up. It's just so difficult to control the composition. But of course, having said that, you know, uh, all the rage nowadays is 2D materials. So graphene and all the TMDs, those, those are all done with uh, CVD. So <clears throat> maybe next year you'd like to have somebody who could do, talk about that. And uh, there's a sol gel technique. It's, it's actually for making you know, thicker films. And uh, so like we, we would use it to make a piezoelectric thin films to make multiphoric devices. It's, it's useful for that. But it's, it's you know, mostly for making thicker bulk-like films. So again, today I'll focus on the PVD techniques. <clears throat> so um, it's, it's, as the name suggests, it's, it's about vapor. Making evaporation is about making the vapor. And uh, b because you're doing vapor uh, deposition, so you can liken it to uh, boiling a pot of water in a pot. And uh, so you get vapor at some point. There's a, a vapor pressure associated with it. And then I guess that these uh, water drops uh, condense on the, uh, the other side of the lid. And so this is exactly uh, the, the same thing that we're doing. <clears throat> and uh, so you, you need a, a, a high vacuum for this. And hopefully, uh, the vacuum is high enough that um, the distance between the sub substrate and the uh, substrate and the target is, uh, you know, shorter than the uh, the mean free path. Otherwise, the atoms get blocked off. So the key characteristics of vapor deposition technique is that it's a line of sight technique. So as it leaves the source, uh, you, you know, if you can see the source from the, that particular position on the target, you're going to get a deposition. So potentially, you could get a pretty large um, um, uniform uh, area too. So, so the interesting thing is that it, it, the vacuum technology uh, took off in the 20th century, and it was helped by the development of this other industry, which also required a huge cans of stainless steel, which had to be absolutely airtight. And does anybody know what that is? <clears throat> I asked this last year, too. Do you remember? I don't remember. <laughs> it's the dairy industry. So dairy industry is where they needed huge, you know, stainless steel is a good uh, airtight can. It needs it to be big. So in the early days, actually, the people used to take things from the uh, dairy farms to make vacuum chambers, is what I heard. Oh, that's right, because the, uh, a lot of the old uh, flanges of this, uh, I forget what it's called, but the 
the O-rings and so on are from this. Right, right, exactly. Industry. Right. So and and they're used to making these big things, and that's what MBEs are. Right. Um, okay. So the mean free path. <clears throat> okay. So. So what, what determines how much material you get out of uh, evaporation? Well, it's, it's the equilibrium vapor pressure of the material. And in terms of actually calculating the thickness, or the amount of material, evap evaporation flux, you can derive from an elementary uh, <coughs> ideal gas law <coughs> um, um, the, the amount. So it's, it has this form. And uh, so, so the key thing is P. P is this equilibrium vapor pressure, and of course you want this background pressure to be as low as possible so that uh, your mean free path is not messed up. So uh, this has the obvious temperature dependence, but, but the key thing is this vapor pressure of different material is, is different for different material, and it's got its own unique uh, temperature dependence too. And you need typically 10 to the minus 3 torr so that uh, so you can, then you can achieve a, a vapor deposition. And uh, so most materials you know, like you need to get it to liquid, like, like water, uh, in order to reach this uh, high vapor, equilibrium vapor pressure. But we are familiar with this phenomenon of sublimation, sub-element, sublimate. So uh, chromium, even though the melting point is upwards of uh, 1,900 degrees, uh, by the time you, you know, raise chromium to a few hundred degrees, you get enough sublimation and you get actually very high uh, vapor pressure. <clears throat> Um, okay, so, th so then the question is, how do we use this to do um, interesting quantum materials, multi-component compounds such as strontium titanate, YBCO, nickel, manganese, gallium? Uh, okay, so you want to do this as simple as possible. Can you take a bulk compound and you do evaporation and get the correct stoichiometric film? The answer is no, <clears throat> because each element has its own uh, equilibrium vapor pressure. So whatever at the temperature is, whatever the input power you're putting into the source, that dictates the vapor pressure, and that would be different for different elements. <clears throat> okay. So this, to, to this end, what we always had to do was to do multi-source evaporation. And then later on, we're going to be hearing from Daryl and uh, uh, Sean about uh, MBEs. And uh, so, so I remember like uh, in the late 80s when we were all excited about high TC superconductors, I was doing E-beam deposition, and uh, of course, so we had to separate the sources. And in this instance, it was kind of tricky because I only had one electron gun. So I had to sweep between yttrium, barium, copper, back to yttrium, barium, copper. And, and, and then as, you know, as I'm at each point, I had to control the power of the uh, electron beam so that you can actually control, tune and control through the thickness monitor the correct stoichiometric ratio that would end up at the substrate. <laughs> But these days, you know, for, for MBE, that's the standard thing. There's a very well, um, you know, uh, you, you could do a good control of the, uh, the flux that comes out of each uh, Nutzen cell. And, and again, so you'll be, you'll be hearing all about uh, molecular beam epitaxy. So, so the one big difference between uh, um, PLD, so PLD is, is a, a, you know, in comparison, a non-equilibrium technique. So non-equilibrium doesn't sound too good, but in this instance, it helps because non-equilibrium means you get stoichiometric transfer. <clears throat> okay, and um, so that's that. I'll, I'll talk about um, uh, PLD. So let's see. So there are different uh, ways to do evaporation. So you just mount these things in a, a vacuum chamber. So these are boats or uh, resistive wires, essentially, that's coated with uh, chromium, for example. And uh, it's just you just send the electricity current through it, and then by the usual power, you can begin to heat up the resistive element, and then if that reaches the, you know, the melting point or the, the liquid point, uh, you, you can begin to get uh, enough um, equilibrium uh, vapor, compression, uh, vapor uh, pressure. And uh, the, the problem, though, is that uh, this resistive heating, it, there's a limitation. You can only achieve so much power by sending current in a small thing. And so, for example, a lot of the uh, refractory metals, such as niobium and tungsten, you, you just cannot do with, with these resistive uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, these, uh, boats and stuff like that. So, so in that instance, what we would do is electron beam evaporation. So with this, uh, so there's an electron gun at the bottom of these chambers. And then you can, you can put a pretty large, um, you can deliver a pretty large uh, power to that. And then, but you need to do this bending, and then you need to control the beam, and then you want to swirl the beam around so that it uniformly melts the, uh, uh, the source. Um, 
So this is it's a common technique too, of course. Okay, so let's talk about a PLD. As I said, PLD is a non-equilibrium technique. So it started around, well, I mean, some people say it, it was done even before the 70s, but it became, began to be popular around 1970. And uh, it takes advantage of the fact that it, it just so happened that many of the materials that we're interested in making films of, they have good absorption around this 200 to 400 nanometer, okay? So, so, so the idea is that we use the laser, laser beam, laser power to deliver the thermal energy to the target in a really short period of time. And so that results in this explosion, instantaneous evaporation, and uh, that leads to what, this uh, non-equilibrium uh, process. And so it's, it became really popular um, in the, uh, the 90s because everybody was doing YBCL, and as long as you had the right target. So some, some uh, compounds, you know, the vapor uh, uh, pressure still wins, and then you need to do correction and all of that. But for, for, for the most part, you know, if, as long as you, you can have, you have a good stoichiometric target, okay, bismuth, bismuth ferrite, we need to add a little bit more bismuth because bismuth likes to leave, but uh, <clears throat> so that, that's the nice thing about PLD is that whatever you can get, get a, a little chunk of material, you can mount it in the PLD and you can start making some films. It's, it's a very uh, um, simple technique. Again, and the key, key thing is that it's this optical irradiation with the laser in a in the really short period of time. So, um, okay, so you, you could do reactive PLD. A lot of the time we're making uh, oxide, so you put in uh, oxygen into it. And, and the studying what's happening inside a plume, it's a dynamic situation. It's, it's not, a, not a trivial thing to do, to measure all the species that's present in, uh, in the plume. And that's still a very uh, popular topic of research among PLD uh, people. <clears throat> Okay, so, so again, uh, so, so it's delivering this um, uh, laser power into the target, but as soon as you put something into the material, there's a thermal diffusivity associated with it, so the power begins to uh, dissipate. So that, that's the, uh, the trade-off, how fast you can pump in a certain amount of uh, a thermal energy into a given area of the material before it spreads out. So you could do this uh, trade-off calculation, and then you end up with a... Uh, expression that looks like this. So U, US is the uh, uh, sublimation energy that's needed to do evaporation. So there's a target uh, density, and so kappa is the diffusivity, and tau is the uh, laser pulse width. So that's, that's the amount of time it's taking to deliver the energy to the, uh, uh, the target. So with this, you could do calculation using some typical numbers, and then you see that um, you, you need about something like 60 millijoule for a pulse, okay? So what, what's interesting and changed in the last couple of years is that until until last couple of years ago, everybody was just using Exmer laser, and Exmer laser has these 248 nanometer krypton fluoride. But last year we had this uh, uh, Ukrainian um, neon crisis where we could not get any neon. Because apparently most of the neon comes from uh, some mine in uh, Ukraine, and uh, there was a period where there was nothing coming because of the uh, international crisis. And all the semiconductor industry bought all the neon that was available in the market. So for a tank of neon that we would pay $1,000 to $2,000, which would last us a year, at one point it was forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. So we were all freaking out. Maybe this is the end of PLD. <clears throat> Uh, but, but it turns out there are other lasers. Okay, so the, first of all, the price came down. So now, actually, last month, we paid uh, 4K or something, which is still expensive, but it's, it's okay. It's an important buffer gas for the, the eczema. So there's other types of laser, because if you look at this, 60 millijoule is not that much. So it turns out YAG laser can deliver this. So, so YAG has become a popular um, a laser to do pulse laser deposition. And the nice about the YAG laser is that it's a tabletop laser. It's like this. And the price is half to a third of a big eczema laser. The only thing is that, um, you know, YAG is 1.06. So to get to the same uh, wavelength, you need to do uh, 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 wavelength uh, uh, quadrupling, you know. I mean, uh, frequency quadrupling. But <clears throat> other than that, so, so then, of course, that cuts down the energy further. But uh, it, again, many materials you can deposit with, you know, 15 millijoules. So you, with, you could do a YAG laser for this. And that would be nice because it, it requires less maintenance. YAG laser you can plug into the wall, et cetera. 
Okay, let's talk about sputtering. Sputtering is another very common uh, and an important manufacturing technique for making uh, multi-component uh, materials. So unlike evaporation, uh, you, you, you start off with a room temperature target. And so essentially what you're doing is you're bombarding the target with uh, um, uh, ions of inert gas, typically argon, uh, with a density of 10 to the 8 to 10 to the uh, 14. And uh, so essentially what you're doing is that the whole chamber is a circuit to do the discharging of the gas, okay? So um, DC uh, sputtering is done often. It's nice and simple. Power supply doesn't cost so much. If you do RF sputtering, you need to do impedance matching and et cetera. Of course, everything is done automatically these days. But um, RF sputtering is needed because if you have to deposit an insulating material with a really high resistivity, so you could do the simple circuit calculation. And then how much uh, power do you need um, so that you get a reasonable discharge current? This is the current that's needed so that the argon discharges. So if you do a straight out calculation, you get some really large voltage. It's just not possible. So this is why in this case, for well, most insulator materials, you do RF sputtering so that you can reduce the impedance by going to high frequency. OK. So that's, that's, most, that, that's it, really, for the, the deposition techniques. Uh, so there's lots of uh, tricks you can do to make different specialty films. So you'll hear a lot about um, uh, strain and lattice mismatch uh, throughout the school, I, I assume. And, but the, the key thing is uh, you, you want to deposit the films in such a way so that as the, the, uh, the species arrive on the substrate, it has some mobility. It has enough mobility so that you can find the local minimum. minimum to, to land on. So this is why we heat the substrate. And, and then by choosing the correct uh, substrate, substrate that has the same uh, crystal structure, underlying crystal structure, or close uh, lattice constant uh, matching, you can begin to talk about making epitaxial films. And, and here, again, it's really important that uh, the species have enough m mobility after they land on the, uh, on the substrate. Okay, and then, and so you want this temperature to be a good fraction of um, crystallization uh, melting temperature. And this is where it begins to be difficult later on. I'm going to be talking about uh, epitaxial films of a boride films. And he, those crystallization temperature is a couple thousand degrees. So it's, it begins to be difficult to hit the, uh, a fraction of that because most materials like ceramic oxides, you know, metal oxide, um, uh, perovskite materials, they crystallize at around 700, 800, 900 degrees. So uh, if you have a heater, um, with a re even with a resistive heater, that can get you up to 700, that, that could do. But for these uh, borized film, it's been difficult for us. We need, we need to go to higher temperature. And uh, so the, the interesting thing is that if you're able to take two materials, this is your film and the substrate, and, and if they're close enough, in the uh, uh, structure and the, the lattice constant, but there's sufficient difference, then you can force the substrate lattice constant to apply stress into the film. And this is a stress, the strain, strain game that you will hear all about tomorrow from Daryl and, and Karen. And uh, so, so the interesting thing is that these are extremely large force you're talking about. So, uh, you, you know, in the bulk studies, you do pressure effect, high pressure is what leaves many materials to become superconducting. And uh, so it, it, if you're able to, um, you know, overcome this lattice mismatch and make the material fit with a 10% strain, that corresponds to giga, gigapascal of pressure. So you could do directly on the film um, a pressure effect. You could do tensile versus a, a tensile as well as compressive. Okay, so I'm gonna, I just have a few slides to do basic, uh, to talk about basic characterization. Um, so of course, y you know, to uh, measure uh, quantum properties, you have to do transport measurements, applying field this way, that way, vary temperature, all of that. That I'm not gonna talk about. Well, I'm just gonna talk more about the basic stuff. So, because you think you made a film of something and you, are you sure you knew what you were doing is what, uh, you know, people ask us, and, 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 and yes, determining the composition of the film is really important. Even if you're doing PLD, supposedly you have good non-stoichiometric stoichiometric transfer because of the non-equilibrium process, you still need to check it. Do I make the right film? So there's lots of different techniques. 
uh, light in, electron out, electron in, uh, light out. Uh, so, so the most common one that we use is uh, EPMA, electron probe. And uh, the nice thing is many of these techniques are uh, 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 built into the electron microscope. And then if you have that, in fact, you can begin to do spatially resolved mapping of composition, which is a really important um, you know, thing, how uniform is the composition throughout. And some of these techniques, such as RBS, gives you, just by fitting it, the absolute number of the composition. But most of them, you need to be able to do uh, accurate calibration, uh, we do this often. Um, and in, again, depending on the te technique, the accuracy is uh, a few percent to sometimes better than a percent. And the interesting one is uh, a SIMS is uh, you, you essentially you're digging a hole and uh, you, uh, you know, capture all the ions that fly out of it, which was the film material, and then you bend them through this magnet and because you meant, bent it, with all different masses of the species, they land on the different spots in the detector, and depending on the, where they land in terms of the position is how you determine what, what, what was the mass, what was the species. So the problem with this is that it doesn't give you elemental distinction. It just gives you different masses. So you know, we, we would do SIMS, but then it would take us a while to figure out, well, is this something else, like maybe ions of something else, or isotope even, stuff like that. Uh, but the nice thing about SIMS is that because it's uh, <clears throat> digging a hole technique, uh, you keep track of your data as you do the process. It gives you the depth profile. So the depth profile is, is uh, really important. Uh, you, you know, uh, it, you could be making a single layer of film, but you want to know if the film is uh, you know, uniform in composition throughout. And if you're doing multi-layer, certainly you want to know if there is diffusion at the interface. Uh, how sharp is the interface, et cetera. So SIMS can give you this kind of information. Okay, so, uh, but, you know, structure is really important, right? And uh, so we do reciprocal technique, X-ray diffraction, and, or you could do these days, electro, uh, well, you do diffraction in electron microscopy too. You could do real space imaging of the atoms. Uh, so, y you know, you've all learned the, the Bragg's Law. Bragg's Law is, um, not everything, but it's almost everything, in that you could just start with this and you can, you can go pretty far. It give you a diffractogram with a, with a you know, Bragg law, you can figure out the lattice constant, how, how close each peak corresponds to a particular set of planes that happen to satisfy the Bragg condition. And so you can see, ooh, the, the film peaks are pretty close to the substrate peak. That's because we, we chose the right substrate so that they're close to each other because we're trying to make uh, epitaxial films. And then you can also uh, pick, you can tilt the substrate and you can choose different planes, right? I mean, these are obviously set of planes, but there are also other planes that repeat as well. So you can pick a different planes at an angle often, and then you can do an in-plane, you can rotate the film 360 degrees, and then this would be a good way to test if you have epitaxial locking in the four direction. And so this is a by scan. So in this particular experiment, we took amorphous material and then we deposited on top of lanthanum aluminate. But even though it was amorphous to begin with, by doing proper thermal treatment, you were able to turn it into epitaxial film. It sees the substrate underneath and it knew how to align itself. Uh, okay, and then, uh, you know, I'm sure you'll see lots of uh, TM images uh, this week. Uh, you have these uh, fantastic super duper microscopes. Uh, corrected microscope with a spatial resolution of better than angstrom these days. So this isn't even that good, but uh, if you're able to get access to such kind of a microscope, you want to see what's happening at your interface, and you could literally resolve the position of every atom. Okay. So I think, uh, okay, so one other thing. So because we're making thin, uh, thin films, it's, it's good to, again, keep track you know, to, to see what you made. So, and the first thing you do, first thing you have to do is to go to the optical microscope. So the optical microscope can still tell you a lot because a lot of messed up things could happen in your experiments. You have substrate was dirty, and then you can immediately tell from the optical microscope things are just not right. And, and if, remember, optical microscope is optical. That means the wavelength is submicron. That means you can see with your eye down to microns. It's true. So some films you grow, some bulk materials too, 
have sometimes grain features up to microns. So just with optical microscope, you can tell a lot. So the first thing you want to do before you do any other fancy thing is to go to the optical microscope. Okay? And then um, AFM, I think there's a, a practical session on that. Uh, the really nice thing about AFM is that it's got this enormous uh, vertical uh, resolution. So this is a film that looks got interesting uh, pattern, but this is what we would call extremely smooth film because each one of these terrace step is actually uh, four angstrom, right? Because it's an epitaxial film of bismuth ferrite. And so horizontally here, it's three micron, three micron, each step here is 0.4 nanometer. So you could get this kind of an image. And then, so this, this tells you about the way film grew. Film grew in these, in these steps and there are these screw dislocations. So it, it, you, you can learn a lot about the, uh, what took place during the growth. And then of course you can go to SEM. Ooh. And uh, so, so nice thing about SEM and nice thing about epitaxial film is that at the mesoscopic scale, the material have features that resemble or represent the microscopic structure. So for example, this was lithium cobalt films and uh, we grew it in three different orientation by choosing three different substrate materials. So you can see with SEM, oh, it's a cubic material. So if you grew it in, uh, on its head, one, one, one direction, it should have triangular or hexagonal uh, symmetry. And indeed, that's what you have. So cube on cube, it's, it's one, zero, zero. And if you do one, one, zero, you can literally see that it, the crystal is standing on its side. Okay. So that's it. That's, that's it for our basics of uh, that's the introduction. And, and again, I think there's three or four more lectures on different techniques anyway, and there will be practical um, uh, sessions. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, high throughput uh, synthesis uh, of uh, combinatorial thin film library. So, so the, uh, the, the, the idea here is that um, I would submit to you that if, you, if you're in a situation where you have to rapidly optimize your material, mostly by varying the composition, whatever the material is, whatever the physical property is, then I would submit to you that if you can do it this way, you will be much, much better off if you can make hundreds to thousands of different compositions all at once and screen them quickly, rather than if you relied on the traditional uh, one by one Edisonian uh, approach, if you can do it right, you know? And uh, so uh, it, it's an idea actually that started in uh, pharma uh, and, and the biochemistry. And, and so in, in the drug industry, all they do is try to discover uh, cures for common goal and cancer and so that they can keep making more money. So at one point they decided that instead of doing one compound at a time, why don't they do these assays, these uh, 96 volt reaction blocks, so you do these parallel pipettes, so you can test a large number of samples uh, at once. Okay, so um, back in the 90s, uh, my postdoc advisor in Berkeley, he was a biochemist, so he was all, he was part of this idea. And then he, he looked toward us and, and he said, you know, I know really nothing about material science, but I bet this would also work in uh, inorganic hard materials. So why don't you guys try this? And so this was, well, my account and with how my, you know, the group that I was in got started. So anyway, and, and, uh, so, so now it's, it's uh, promulgated to a point where I would say there's probably not one field where you know, somebody's, somebody's doing this approach to optimize the material, discover new compounds, superconductors, ferroelectrics, lots of catalysis works. In many ways, it, it, is, it, it is about uh, playing the chemical lottery because uh, it's about uh, buying a large number of tickets at once so that you can get that you know, $100 or $200. Right, and uh, so it's, it's done in uh, different ways. There's bulk combinatorial, but we, we do everything using thin film techniques. So this was uh, an earlier version of how we used to do these experiments from the 90s. And in fact, it's interesting to go back and look at this because we, we don't do things this way uh, anymore, but the, the fundamental concept is still the same. So the idea is, is that on the single library, you want to make as many different compounds as possible and hopefully you know, large fraction of them are good compounds and not garbage, you know, because, you know, material science is like cooking. If you optimize something for one compound and try to apply the same processing condition for something else, it doesn't work, right? So, 
So that, that's sort of the, the, the most tricky thing here because in, in the, this old uh, embodiment of the technique, so the, the first thing first, we, we wanted to just deposit different combinations of elements on the library. So we would do stencil masking. And then after we do the deposition, you do the, uh, you anneal them all at the same time. Okay, so, so that, that, that's the tricky thing. Sometimes it works, other times it doesn't. But, but it's like any, anything else, the more you know about the material, the better you can design the library. You wouldn't put you know, materials that are too, too disparate in the processing condition on the library. And the challenge has, has always been how to do rapid characterization. And um, so because we were measuring things in a different way, uh, what this uh, had meant for us is that we had to actually develop our own uh, measurement tools. And a lot of the time we relied, of course, on scanning probe microscopes. These are, these are great tools. They scan, and with our contact, they give you information, a variety of physical properties. OK, um, so if you look back in the history, actually, this was not new. Already back in the 60s, people had these ideas of making composition spread so that you can vary composition on the single wafer. And uh, in fact, if you read this paper, Kennedy et al. said, oh, this is it. This is going to be the alloy development from now on. You don't need to do bulk experiment anymore. You can map ternary phase diagram on the single chip. And uh, of course, it didn't quite happen that way. People still do bulk processing, of course. But, uh, and, and it's interesting because uh, he, he, so he, they made this was the Kennedy. They do, this is exactly how we do the experiments 50 years later. Uh, but, but then after the synthesis, in, in the paper, you see that he proceeded to cut this wafer into 200 different pieces so you could do diffraction measurements and the different uh, physical property measurement each one by one. So be, because, because mostly you know, computers didn't exist, uh, uh, robotic things didn't exist, uh, machine learning didn't exist back in the 60s, uh, these techniques, techniques didn't uh, take off. But then I, I would say it, it was, you know, uh, it came up again after the discovery of high TC superconductors. So this is the, the Schultz Shang experiment. So Schultz was my biochemist advisor. So you can see this was a, a Cooperate library, but it looks like a, a biochemistry assay, doesn't it? Right? And uh, uh, the, the other interesting thing is that you can see these bottom half the libraries were all crap because you know what Cooper looks like. Cooper don't look like that. It's when things didn't work out, you get this color, you know. But anyway, it was, it was, the, it was the idea, okay? And then there are a few other uh, great early examples. Uh, uh, Bruce Bandover, now at Cornell, and Tom Malouk did this revolutionary uh, combinatorial electrochemistry where he said you can completely unfold a uh, um, full uh, quaternary a phase space into uh, one library, and then you can do electrochemistry all at once. Okay, so um, I would say, and then in the early days, uh, luminescent materials was a, a big target because it was easy to do the initial screening. So everybody worked on luminescent this, luminescent that. And then we moved on to do more challenging things like uh, smart materials, magnetic materials, quantum materials, etc. Okay, so um, yes, so uh, MGI, um, let's see, the uh, OSTP has changed, White House has changed, but MGI lives on, and we need to um, uh, keep w working on advancing computational tools, experimental tools, digital tools, and, and so we think the combinatorial high throughput experiment is the answer to um, this Venn diagram, which, which sits here, and then just as um, you know, quickly as their computations, um, predictions of new compounds by Karen, we like to test it with the combinatorial library so that we can quickly place feedback. <clears throat> okay, so, so let me just take a step back and think about why we want to do with this kind of an approach. So th this is a kind of a, um, a sweeping statement, but within some classes of mat materials, um, Functionalities, figures of merit, increase when you increase the number of elements that's, uh, that go into it. This is certainly true for superconductors, true for some ferroelectrics, true for magnetism. So, so you want to just keep adding more elements, okay? So the problem is that the combination, the number of combinations uh, blows up. 
And then you immediately uh, you start asking uh, just how many G, how many compounds do I need to make, or you know, how many do I need to make before I can graduate, kind of thing. And, and so you look at the periodic table at large, and so say, well, let's just take the non-poisonous one and the uh, easier to work one transition metal. There's 60 useful elements. And this is actually an old number. By now, of course, ICSD contains 150,000 compounds. So there are about 150,000 compounds. And then so you compare everything that's been studied in, uh, and that's cataloged in Landau-Bornstein. Uh, uh, that, that against just, you know, you just do combinatorial pigeonholing games. You take two seats and you take how many different combinations in which you can see two elements. And, and so it turns out binary compounds are, are studied. All binary phase diagrams are known, right? Some of them are not too accurate, but they've been studied, okay? But when you come to ternary, things become already uh, are pretty critical. It turns out only about, so, so 60 times, okay, correct, 59 times, 58 times permutations, et cetera. So compare that number to everything that's been studied. It's only about 3%. And when you come to quaternary, it turns out it's only 0.0% of uh, all possible combination that's been studied. And beyond is just a handful of high TC superconductors and these crazy metallic glasses. Who knows how they came up with these uh, element combinations. So when, the, when the, the situation is so staggering, it seems difficult, but you know, this is a one embodiment of how we would capture a large number of variation. We, we don't really do this technique anymore, but it still works, and I think catalysis people use this technique. So we do stencil masking. And uh, so, the, so, so wherever there is opening is where you did do the physical vapor deposition, the material goes through. So, so here we go, we take a substrate. First mask, we deposit barium. Uh, you rotate the mask, deposit calcium, uh, strontium, lead. Okay, I'm done with the first mask. Second mask. Into the corners of original quadrants, zirconium, tantalum, niobium, titanium. So just with two masks, with eight depositions. Nowadays, we could do that in you know, a few hours. Right? You have, we have one of these chambers. So we, what we did with, is with, with two, two masks, with eight deposition, we, we made 16 different combinations of elements that could lead to formation, potentially lead to formation of these compounds. Now, whether or not they actually form or not is a material science question. And uh, so, so this is where you, you need to have a good instinct about, gee, do I want to mix titanates with tungsten bronze, with zirconates? And the answer is probably not. not that's not a good idea. But you know, as long as you're working with all titanates, uh, they all have a similar uh, s formation process. You can probably put it together. But the point is, this is how you can begin to, uh, um, you know, use the number game to create large number of samples. So if you had, if you did this, I just did that for two masks. But if you did it for five masks, all you need to do is 20 deposition. You can do that in a couple of days, and you end up with four to the five thousand. 24 different combinations of elements. So that's one way to do this kind of an experiment. So in fact, this is how this was library was made. And, and this, this is a picture of what the chip looked like. This is, not, this is the luminescent property. We found a couple of interesting blue emitting material. But this is actually what the chip looked like after I took it out of the chamber. This is one inch by one inch silicon wafer. And, and just the diversity you can achieve by doing this technique. And different precursor materials have all different indices of refraction, that's reflected in this, this uh, nice, nice color, yes? Is the substrate at all important? This is, poly we're doing polycrystalline, so we do SiO2, yeah. That's what I think, yeah. Uh, okay, but then fast forward, so this was back in the 90s. Fast forward 10, 20 years, and it's all about um, perovskite playing atomic Lego blocks, and as you know, you, by choosing the correct fundamental drilling blocks, and you and the repeating units, you can tune the properties of perovskites from superconducting to insulating to um, something that exhibits uh, optical properties to piezoelectric, et cetera. So we, we cannot do, do this kind of tuning if you're doing this crude technique. I mean, there are instances, like I said, for in the catalysis industry, there is this kind of uh, function agnostic mentality. They say, but whatever it is in, in, in there, as long as it's working as a catalyst, we take it kind of thing. 
So then this, this kind of technique is still fine because the number is the most important thing, the large number of samples. But, but we want to do this kind of experiment. How, how, how do we systematically uh, change the properties, the, the layering? So to this end, we, we do this kind of an experiment. So this is, again, a PLD technique. And it's called a, a, a composition spread. And so the idea is uh, I, we have two targets which have the, the composition that correspond to the end compositions uh, that you want to place on the ends of the composition spread. This is a thin film, typically one centimeter long, and we grow up to maybe a couple hundred nanometer. And then we do a series of uh, uh, moving shadow, moving shutter deposition during the um, deposition so that you end up with a, a, a series of a wedge uh, deposition, right? You get a wedge if you move a shutter in front of your substrate during the deposition. And uh, so actually this one, I should just show a movie. So this is what it looks like. So the laser beam is not shown, but you can see when it's lit up, this is the plume, laser is hitting. So now we're hitting blue sub uh, material and you get a gradient, right? Wedge gradient. So this is the moving shutter. It's a little bit hard to see. But now, we, now we're doing a wedge in the other way. And then you go back and forth, back and forth. And so the key here is that um, schematically, this is how we're doing the deposition. But we want to make sure that the thick, thick end of each wedge is less than the unit cell. Okay? So as long as you make the wedges to be less than a unit cell, we're doing this at the epitaxial deposition condition. That's why its substrate is red. It's, uh, red is about 800 degrees, right? And, uh, um, <coughs> so, so anyway, because we're doing the deposition at uh, epitaxial condition, so this is schematically what we're doing, but because each, unit, each wedge is less than the unit cell, we do actually get intimate mixing. We, we're not making some funky super lattice spread. We, we could do that if you want to, but we, we rather do continuous elemental substitution experiment, like, like here, bismospherite. Uh, substituted, the A side is substituted. So this is the, uh, the image that we'd like you to have. This is, even though we make it this way, this is actually what you end up having. And so you can now take this and you can do systematic mapping of the structure, these electric properties, magnetic property, et cetera. Okay, so that was that. And then, uh, so here's, here's one example. We, we are still trying to find new superconductors, although that's a really hard thing to do. So this is actually a known a material system, so we took barium bismuthate and barium uh, lead oxide. And then, so you can see from the x-ray that you measure at each point, the lattice constant is continuously changing, as it should. And so we look at these regions carefully. And uh, so this is a known uh, uh, superconducting system, but in, in, in the middle you get superconductors, these are all downturns, and this is resistance versus temperature. And then you have metallic region on one side, and then you get insulating on the other side. So on one chip, you can map the entire, I mean, if you do it right. And this wasn't actually too difficult to do. Uh, we were, you, can, you can map the whole superconducting phase diagram in one, on one uh, chip. OK, so let me show you another, oh, I have some time. Uh, so th so that, that's with the PLD. Oh, maybe. Just kidding, just kidding. You're the boss. It's not as a I, I know. <laughs> So, uh, okay, so we do, we do also co-sputtering um, to make composition spread. So uh, here it's, it's even easier. All you need is a co-sputtering chamber, which you can find in any university. And the only thing we do is that we, we tilt the gun head in such a way so that we're deliberately making composition variation. Right, so usually the, the goal is do you want to make uniform, so you need to do confocal uh, placement uh, angling of the gun. But here the goal is opposite. So we purposely vary. And then so we, we can go to electron probe and map the composition. So around here is high aluminum, around here is high manganese, here is nickel, and somewhere in the middle is uh, 111 half Hoistler composition. In, in, at least in composition. Whether you have the structure or not is, uh, you, mean you need to do a complete you know, uh, diffraction study. And these days, it's about uh, comparing with uh, predicted phase diagrams, prediction of uh, uh, stability of new compounds. So, so we, we work with the uh, A-flow gang a lot. And uh, so we make it, and then we, they, they tell us, hey, these are the predicted compounds. You see it in your phase diagram, composition spread or not, that kind of thing. So um, 
So this is one uh, screening technique, which uh, we still use sometimes, uh, scanning squid. So it's a squid, but it's, it's uh, made of uh, high temperature superconductor squid. So even though it's a squid, you can use it to map magnetic properties at room temperature, of materials at room temperature. So this is the, what the raw image of nickel manganese gallium spread looks like. So you can, you can see these are the magnetic regions because it's got uh, north and south. Right? It's, you, can, you can see the silhouette of the pattern that we create by the physical shadow masking. And then so you could do this uh, FFT kind of calculations to convert the uh, field that's emanating from the sample, which squid detects, convert that to uh, remnant magnetization. Uh, and then you could do some other measurements, and this is what we call functional phase diagrams. So in this particular instance, we're looking for coexistence of uh, martensite uh, and then a magnetic region. And uh, so, so sometimes we are lucky or we haven't done complete literature search. And in this particular instance, uh, after uh, we did our experiment, we found that there was a high temperature calculated phase diagram. So these are the tie lines, and uh, of course these are bulk points that people did experiments. And so, you know, right off the bat, you can see, oh yeah, it's the, the beta phase that becomes the Martin site at low temperature. So this is the kind of uh, experiment that we do in, in, a, in a single wafer. Okay, so let me uh, I'll talk about uh, some aromatic savoride, which I think you, you, you hear about this week. It's a very important condo topological insulator. There's been lots of uh, fantastic single crystal work that's been done but uh, there's not much, almost none, thin film work. And, uh, but thin films are needed if you want to probe interesting uh, topological properties. You want to make devices, Josephson junctions, et cetera. So you need thin films. Uh, so this is a, you know, there's a mounting evidence that it's, a, it's got a surface, um, protected surface state, a topological insulator. So the, the problem, though, is that boron and samarium have such different ionic mass that it's really difficult to control the stoichiometry of, if you, if you just want to make uniform film, okay? So, so we turn to the composition spread technique. So here the goal was kind of different, right? So we knew the composition that we were going for, but uh, we, we had to make it somewhere. And it, if you just use a single target trying to make uniform, you just can't do it. It always deviates from the desired um, composition. So we did the two target deposition, and, and we said, well, somewhere on the spread, there's going to be a region with the correct composition, because it's continuously changing. And so this is kind of complicated. But the main thing is that uh, this is the only important thing. So this is three inch wafer and the composition. And then lo and behold, there is a correct spot. I mean, there's a spot with the correct composition. 14% corresponds to uh, hexaboride. Okay, and then we saw that uh, this hallmark of a uh, condo topological insulator is the saturation of the, uh, the resistance at low temperature only happens, you get, only get the right value when the composition is correct. If you measure some other places, you, you don't get it. So we were able to uh, make a thin film of the scenario hexaboride in this way. So one interesting thing that we encountered though is that we essentially, well, with this composition spread, was covering this region. Right, from here to here. So that means we should have had samarium boron 66 to hexaboride to tetraboride to the 2,5 phase. Okay, so they should all be there in the spread if you correctly did the phase mapping. But we don't get that. It turns out everything we see is samarium hexaboride. So the lattice constant is continuously changing. So it's, it's not samarium hexaboride, but it's off stoichiometric, but the structure is samarium hexaboride. So why is that? We were expecting to see tetraboride. What, what's going on? So we went to uh, uh, Stefano Cotarolo and the A-Flow gang, and uh, they did this uh, convex hull calculation. So the convex hull uh, tells you uh, which is the most stable compound. So it's the most stable compound. The low, lowest point, this is the formation enthalpy, uh, is the one that should form. So if you look at this blue line, indeed, it says tetraboride should be the most stable compound. You should get most things to be tetraboride, okay? But we see hexaboride everywhere. So what, what's going on? So they did a few more calculations. They, they came up with this concept of, uh, uh, what is it called? Entropy 
uh, entropic temperature. So it's not the actual temperature, but it's the, this reflects the ability of the material to absorb translational entropy. Okay? So it turns out that, that is what we are doing. We're not doing evaporation. Evaporation, as you will hear, is, is like a s snow gently falling. It's this gentle process. Sputtering is this kind of thing. It's a hyperthermal process. Okay? So you have enormous translational entropy in a plasma plume. And then it, it splatters. It lands on the substrate. Okay, so it's a compound that could absorb the, all that entropy immediately, as Stefano explains to me, is, is the, the structure that's going to form. So if you look at these, these different entropic temperature curves, just by a sliver, you see, cinnamon hexaboride has a higher entropic temperature than tetraboride. So that means as it cools, quench gets immediate from the plasma plume to the substrate, cinnamon hexaboride could form quickly. So this is the uh, explanation okay? well, as to why uh, samarium hexaboride seems to be forming. OK, and then uh, Seng and Lee did a lot of work. And he was actually able to raise the temperature of the deposition. And uh, we were able to get epitaxial uh, samarium hexaborides in films for the first time. So this is nice. Then you could do different angular dependent uh, device experiments, et cetera. OK, by the same token, we said it would be nice to also look at something similar, yttrium hexaboride, it, it turns out. It's a known BCS superconductor, but it's never been made in films before. And then from the bulk study, there were reports that mm, there's some funky stoichiometric thing, as in the superconducting property would vary as a function of stoichiometry. So here, we, we did a similar experiment. In fact, here, all we did was a self composition spread. Self as in we mean to make a uniform single target film, but if you go away, because the mass difference in boron and yttrium is so much that as you go away, you start just losing boron. So, so this is the wafer. If you look at here, this is directly underneath the yttrium hexaboride target. It's more or less stoichiometric, but as you go far away, you begin to lose boron. Okay. And then so he did this uh, study comprehensively. And then indeed, it d does depend on uh, sensitively to the correct uh, um, uh, ratio uh, of boron to yttrium. And then from this, we were able to optimize uh, the compound with the highest TC. Highest TC is what we want. OK. But then why, why, do, we, why do we do this? Why, don't we, why, why are you interested in yttrium hexaboride? OK, so it's the first time thin films were made, so that's good. But we wanted to see if we can make a bilayers of a superconductor and the samarium hexaboride. And if they were of same structure or they, re they were uh, of the same processing condition, then we should be able to make good bilayers. And we could begin to look into things like superconductivity induced into the topological insulator. This was the goal of the study. Okay? And uh, so, so that's what we're doing. I mean, there's lots of interesting predictions about helical superconductivity. Majorana mode, et cetera, if you're able to induce superconductivity into the surface state of topological insulators. So all the studies done to date uh, on bismuth selenide. Right? So, so the nice thing about samarium hexaboride, actually, is that it's a true bulk insulator. I mean, bismuth selenide has, has a problem, right? Because the bulk is not quite insulating. And uh, so first thing first, though, we wanted to demonstrate uh, proximity effect. Can you induce? superconductivity from niobium or some superconductor into samarium hexaboride. So this was the experiment we did. This, this is not yttrium hexaboride. This was, the, this was easy to do. We just deposit samarium hexaboride, and then we slap niobium on top. Okay? So what you see here is that, OK, if you just look at niobium-only layer as a comparison, as a standard, so these are different thicknesses. As the material gets thinner and thinner, of course, the TC goes down as it approaches coherence length. But if you do this, same thickness on top of samarium hexaboride, the TC goes down much, much faster. Because this is because exactly of the proximity effect. The superconducting odor parameter begins to bleed in to the uh, surface state of the samarium hexaboride. So based on this, we were able to calculate uh, the Fermi velocity, the thickness of the surface state, et cetera. But this shows that, um, again, we could do this nice transport study because we don't have leakage in the insulating bulk. Everything comes from over here. Okay, so this demonstrated that we have proximity effect. 
Okay, so that was this kind of structure. We did some MX boride, and we put niobium on top. And then you could do some kind of a transport study. But we, if you really wanted to probe the superconductivity induced into topological insulator, this is the, the flipped structure is what you need. You can't do that. Because this way you can now look at look for things from the top. Okay? And this is what this HRM hexaboride, samarium hexaboride allows us to do. Superconductor on the bottom, topological insulator on the top. And again, inc incidentally, using bismuth selenide again, such studies have been done and there is some interesting results. But um, so we, we were looking for um, the presence of a, a topological superconducting state. So the technique that we used was Andre reflection. And uh, so, uh, so what Andre reflection does is you take a normal material and then you make a junction with a superconducting material into that, okay? So we would take a gold tip and then we'd approach this supposedly proximity superconducting um, samarium exobore layer. So this is the gold and this is superconducting state. And uh, so in and, and this way you can probe the nature of superconductivity and something about the uh, the spins, et cetera. And then there's, it's all worked out in the BTK theory. Uh, in, the, in the correct Andre limit, you should get doubling of the uh, conductance. Okay. So, um, and then we were able to do this experiment. So it's the gold tip. So this is the S, I mean, sorry. This is the N, and then this is the superconductivity induced into some aromexoboride. So by varying the thickness of some aromexoboride, we could see that indeed it is superconducting. So for really thick end, forget it, it's not superconducting. So you get this usual funnel um, shape that you expect. And then if you put no samarium hexaboride, pure HRM hexaboride, you get the usual uh, superconducting tunneling behavior. So by continuous, continuously changing the thickness, we found that only when it's the right thickness, you, you only observe this when it's the correct thickness, but you get this perfect Andre reflection, exact doubling of the conductance inside the gap. Okay? So let's, let's look at Andre reflection spectroscopy a little bit more carefully because Xiaohan made this nice, nice slide. So again, you come from the, the normal side, gold, and as long as the, the, uh, the voltage is within the band gap, in the superconducting side, there's nothing. The term hexaboride or induced uh, into some hexaboride even is a um, normal BCS like superconductor. So the only way you can inject the carrier into it is that it needs a, a Cooper, it forms a Cooper pair. But in, in doing so, you need to um, um, have a reflection of the hole so that you can have a, a singlet a Cooper pair form. Okay? And then as a result of this, be, because you have something that you have a hole bouncing back inside the gap, you get doubling of the conduction. So this is what Andre figured out back in 64. So it turns out though, you get scattering. Scattering happens. You can't make perfect junctions. Scattering happens all the time. So this, you, you never ever see perfect Andre reflection if you just make a normal junction. In fact, I've been doing this kind of experiment on and off for maybe 20 years, and I've never seen perfect doubling of the conductance. Okay? But then we see now what's going on. So the, and the reason, again, this thing is suppressed is because of the scattering. There's impurity scattering. Okay? But now we have a topological insulator and the superconductor, so there is a gap. And then we have this protected state, which protects it from the impurity scattering. So you no longer have impurity scattering. And this is how we end up back having the doubling of the conductance again. So um, Valentin Stanev is doing the calculation, but uh, so he says it's effectively lowering of the, the Z, the barrier parameter. And then, in fact, he did some uh, uh, modified BTK theory, and uh, um, he tells me that it's, it's equivalent to the Klein tunneling. Okay, so, so it, 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 that's the paradox where no matter what the Z barrier height is, you get perfect transmission. Okay, I'm, I'm done. Uh, okay, so again, by tuning the thickness, we see perfect Andre reflection only when it's the correct proximity thickness. And so this is the signature of the topological superconductivity. And uh, as far as we could tell, it's the first time this was uh, observed in this, in this way. OK, so I just want to end by showing one um, ad slide. So, uh, so this is the winter school. 
on uh, quantum materials. So we've been running this uh, machine learning for materials research summer camp in, uh, at the end of June. We did it for two years. We're going to do it again. It's annual. Uh, so this is uh, what we do. It's like, uh, you know, this school, because this school co copied our format, right? <laughs> so we do four days of uh, lectures. It's hands-on. So we do noise reduction, unsupervised machine learning, supervised, we do simple computer vision. And the focus is, unlike other camps, we do focus on experimental. This is where we start with the noise reduction. And we, we not we, I mean, I didn't. We, my colleagues developed all Python-based modules. So, so we're going to do it again uh, um, this year. If you're interested, uh, you can you know, contact me, or you can go to the Nano Center website. So we've been doing this machine learning uh, uh, summer camp uh, for two years, and in the winter, this is the second time we do uh, quantum materials, so machine learning, quantum materials, machine learning, quantum materials. So the interesting thing is that thing, things begin to merge, you know. So now we're doing, trying to do research in uh, machine learning on quantum materials, and hopefully in the future uh, schools we can have such discussion as well. And I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>